Urban Nation, which is what we're going to be discussing today and which I'll do an outline of, is in fact the culmination of uh, se several decades of working with a lot of other people, many of whom are on the call today, uh, on, the, on the, the question of the place of cities in Canada. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of us have worked together uh, with the late Jane Jacobs in uh, things like the Toronto Charter Movement, uh, the C5 meetings of mayors from Vancouver, Winnipeg, Montreal, uh, Toronto and Calgary, and uh, a number of other issues that have sought to uh, explain uh, the role of cities to Canadians and to try and find a, a more, more uh, productive and powerful place for cities in, in, the, uh, in the nation's uh, future. So what I'm going to do is have a, a, take a very uh, short uh, run through the book in a, in a sense of outlining for you what it's about and some of the main arguments in the book and uh, and then look forward to uh, your comments and your questions in in the uh, when I'm done and the essential argument of the book is that uh, in the 140 plus years since confederation uh, Canada has changed dramatically as a country uh, at the time of confederation Canada was about 80 percent rural and 20% uh, and uh, people living in towns and cities. And uh, in, in, in the decades since Confederation, that has completely flipped, so that now Canada is one of the most urban countries in the world, with 80% of our uh, population living in cities. <clears throat> and in the process, our big ur urban regions have become our principal economic, social, and cultural engines. And uh, Canada, competes in the modern world economy on a city region to city region basis. This urbanization was driven by two major factors. One was urbanization itself, the movement of people from the hinterlands into towns and cities and and it was a two-stage movement of people really moving into regional towns and cities and then the, in the last uh, four or five decades moving into the large urban regions. And we have three uh, principal large urban regions in Canada, in Vancouver, uh, Montreal and Toronto. The other great uh, uh, movement it, it was immigration. And uh, Canada has, has had a couple of uh, major waves of, of immigration. And uh, the original waves of immigration, and the principal ones being in the first part of the 20th century, uh, when Laurier sought to populate the West, uh, the movement was really of farmers moving from farms and other places, mostly the United States and Northern Europe, uh, to farms in, in Western Canada. And, uh, but in, in recent decades, in the recent uh, 40 years or so, uh, that immigration has been people moving from cities to cities and in very much from large cities and large uh, urban regions around the world into our uh, urban regions. And that is reflected in the uh, very dramatic growth of our large urban regions uh, compared to our second tier and third tier of cities over the last, uh, the last four decades. So Canada has changed dramatically since Confederation. Uh, but everything, uh, it seems, has changed except for our governmental arrangements. <clears throat> our governmental arrangements are established in the British North America Act, as, as most of you know, and the division of uh, powers uh, is set out in, in sections uh, 91 and 92. And in section 92, it, it's clear that cities are the creatures of the provinces uh, with few residual powers, and if you if you care to look at section 92.8, you'll find cities there, and they're nestled between asylums and taverns, uh, which will give you an idea of, of uh, the importance with which they were viewed at the time of Confederation. Um, the um, the the cities were given few residual powers at the time, and. Uh, and my argument in the book is that we need to empower our cities in order to build the, the nation. The nation, and the the principal um, uh, point I make in the book is is around control of destiny. Uh, as long as cities have to look elsewhere for decisions uh, to be made to influence their future, 
uh, they're going to be in, in a very tough position to be able to grow at the, uh, at the rate that their citizens want them to grow and, and that the modern competitive imperatives uh, say we should grow. And so I, I think in order to empower cities, we need to look at three areas. And the first of these areas is finance. Uh, the three are finance, powers, and governance, and we'll deal with finance first. Cities must be able to fund their plans. And uh, the, the, we ask too much of mayors and councils to come up with a vision of the city and come up with a plan uh, to, to uh, bring that vision into play but deny them the financial capacity to be able to do that. So cities must be able to fund their plans, and so our revenue capacities at the city must align with, with the obligations that, that we have. And uh, that's not the case currently. Uh, cities have too few revenue tools and none that grow with the economy. And those of you who know uh, municipal finance will know that Canadian cities rely on property tax to a very high extent for about 50% of their revenues. And if you compare this to the average in the United States of 15%, or in Europe of about 5%, uh, you'll, you'll see that we're out of whack in this regard. And the difference is in those other jurisdictions in the United States and in Europe, that cities have access to other kinds of, of taxes and other kinds of revenue tools. And uh, principal among them, income taxes and sales taxes. Income taxes are the, big, the biggest tax uh, uh, bundle, uh, the most productive uh, tax for governments, and sales tax are the next biggest, and cities in Canada don't have access to either one of these taxes. So cities, in a sense, need to be able to decide uh, whether to levy these kinds of taxes or not, and to set the rate at which they would be levied. And without that ability to raise the revenues to uh, match to the obligations that they have, cities will constantly be in a position of going to another level of government, to the province or the federal government, and asking them for money to fund their big ticket items like transit, like assisted housing, and like low income housing, and like services for the settlement of, of and, and integration of immigrants, which is such a key to our future in Canada. And in, in the process of going to those other levels of government to uh, get the money, uh, they run into problems of having to align the agenda with the agenda of either the province or the federal government. And so in that sense, they don't have the control of destiny that they need. The next area of uh, is powers. And, um, and, and cities have traditionally been very underpowered in Canada. And in discussions of power, some people would make the point that our large urban regions need essentially the powers of a province, uh, that they need a broad uh, control over a broad range of things, including education and health care. When you talk to uh, health care uh, professionals uh, that work in the cities, they will tell you that because of the di difference in makeup of the uh, urban population, in good part because of the presence of so many newcomers, they're, they're not only treating uh, different uh, kinds of diseases uh, and different kinds of illness, but there are dramatically different protocols of care that are required. And so that what may work in a, um, an area that has uh, uh, less immigration in it uh, doesn't necessarily work very well in the city. So for the city to be able to design uh, a particular approaches in health care would be a very positive uh, positive thing. And similarly in education and the way the schools operate, the, uh, as many of you know in schools uh, across the city like Toronto, uh, depending on where the waves of immigration are coming from at any one time, uh, teachers can have dramatically different makeups in their classes, uh, different in, in terms of uh, where the kids are from, what languages they speak, uh, what, what levels of learning they have already. And they need to be able to respond to this in order to make sure the kids get the best education. And so local control of the education system and uh, the ability to uh, pay for those things are critically important. The argument uh, that uh, many make, and, and which in fact 
is in, embodied in the uh, City of Toronto Act, which was negotiated in the last number of years by the uh, between the uh, province of Ontario and the City of Toronto, is that unless the province can show a clear provincial interest in something, the, sh the city itself should have the power uh, to, to make whatever change um, it, 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 it feels it needs. And uh, that's probably a very good uh, principle to operate on and one that could be broadened considerably. The third area that, that we, I talk about in the book is governance. And um, my, my argument there is that cities need much broader latitude to construct their, their own governance models. Uh, they need to be able to decide the size of council, which they can currently do in, in Ontario, and also how it's elected and what sub-council bodies uh, it, it might want to include. Uh, including things like community boards and various committees. Uh, they should be able to, in, in effect, des design the democratic structure that they feel will best serve their citizens and, uh, and best serve the job of, of city building. Uh, they also should be able to decide, which they cannot do at this point in Ontario, but they should be able to decide whether parties, political parties, can be formed at the municipal level. Of course, in uh, Vancouver and Montreal, political parties are and have been part of the scene for many years and, uh, and, and, and play a, a critical role in, in uh, both uh, creating efficiencies, reducing the transaction cost of doing, uh, of, of doing politics at the council level, uh, but they also create transparency to the citizens uh, because they can understand uh, what a party stands for by studying the party platform uh, rather than have to pursue uh, each individual member of council to un understand what they're about and, and what they uh, uh, what they're likely to, to do uh, when they're sitting on council. I think that the uh, question of transaction costs, uh, the, the amount of uh, efficiency that's present and the amount of energy that has to be expended in uh, putting together coalitions uh, to support uh, legislation or, or motions going through council is a critical issue and I think parties is one way to help re reduce that. And the other uh, which I talk about in the book is creating stronger executive powers in the mayor's office. In Canada we typically operate on, on what is called the weak mayor system where mayors have uh, some additional but not extensively additional powers of any other member of the, the uh, city council. Uh, in many other cities around the world, including New York and uh, w w uh, with Mayor Bloomberg and uh, Chicago with Mayor Daley and, and uh, the London mayors, uh, they, they have a strong mayor system where the mayor has uh, quite strong executive powers and a quite a strong ability to um, direct the business of the city. In the book, uh, in the last section of the book, I talk about creating change uh, through three scenarios. Um, the, the first one is uh, an, an incremental set of steps uh, and talks about the, um, the different ways in which the federal government uh, w might be involved in, in uh, municipal level activities. Uh, because of the BNA Act and the division of powers that I talked about at the outset, uh, the federal government has typically been reluctant to uh, engage in this, and the current federal government is no different than uh, the Kraken government and, and uh, various governments before that. Uh, but the federal government can do two things without getting in the way of uh, uh, provincial concerns about the BNA. Uh, one is that they can provide things directly to people. Uh, they can deal directly with citizens. So they can affect uh, things like um, uh, transit systems in um, in cities by doing things like making uh, transit passes tax deductible, and uh, and and therefore increase their attractiveness, increase the ridership, and increase the revenues of of uh, municipal transit services. So and and they can create uh, uh, stimulate the creation of of housing through uh, creating refundable tax benefits for housing and and. Uh, and, and instruments like that, using the tax system to interact directly with Canadians. Uh, 
the other thing the federal government can do is deal with intermediaries. And one uh, sample I, example I cite in the book is uh, when the federal government uh, worked with the Federation of Ca Canadian M Municipalities uh, to uh, create an a set of environmental activities and approaches to uh, for cities. And uh, so working either directly with, P uh, with citizens or through intermediaries are ways that uh, the federal government can be involved with this, with cities. Uh, the this, this, this second approach, the second scenario I deal with is a uh, more moderate change, uh, more than incremental but not dramatic, uh, a moderate change and, and that's uh, through using the existing powers of provinces. And uh, provinces have full authority over cities. They have uh, you know, quite uh, considerable authority and that they can dismiss sitting councils and mayors and uh, require cities to restructure and, and uh, virtually put them in, in uh, under receivership or under trusteeship if, if they so wish. And uh, that happened in the city of Toronto, of course, at the time of amalgamation uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, but that, that, that power can be used positively as well, and, and uh, the City of Toronto Act is one example of, of that, of uh, the, the province intervening to increase powers at the city level and, and, uh, and, uh, and give them some uh, revenue authority. The, um, uh, the, in the book I talk about going further than that and creating virtual uh, city-states or city-provinces out of, out of uh, the, the major urban regions, so in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal, the provincial, the provinces could do that if they wish to do that and give them considerable more self-government and control over their destiny. Uh, and, and that is totally, there would be no need for constitutional change and no, no need for anything uh, uh, negotiating with other provinces or any other, or, or the federal government or any other such thing. Uh, as you all know Canadians uh, t tend to shy away from dealing with the constitution and constitutional change. So this section of the book gives a, gives a way you could do that. The third section of the book says we ought to get over that reluctance to deal with the con uh, constitution and, and talks about a more dramatic reconsideration of Canada uh, by locating power where people live. So the two most dramatic aspects of that would, would be to create the the city-states that I've just talked about, the city provinces uh, in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal, but also would contemplate maritime union and prairie union as a way of creating uh, large enough entities and some com uh, population comparability bit between the various uh, entities that then would make up the country. and, and uh, and we finish this uh, this visual presentation here with a map of what that might look like, uh, and you see that on your screen now. That, of course, is dramatic, and uh, I, I'm, I can assure you I have not been holding my breath for the last two years since the book came out for that to happen, uh, but that is something to think about. But I think just in conclusion that I would say that Canada has a very uh, hard choice to make. And, uh, and that is that we, we, we can embrace the modern reality of, the, of, of an urban world uh, where urban regions are competing with, with each other uh, for eco economy, for uh, social and cultural matters, uh, for immigrants, and uh, for the future. Or we can remain enthralled to our outdated constitutional arrangements. And my caveat, my advice would be that uh, Canada will pay a very big price if, if we uh, stick with these constitutional arrangements that are so comprehensively out of step with our, our major future challenges. So, Sandra, with that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Alan, uh, for your presentation. So, um, everyone on the webinar is welcome to submit a question uh, via chat, but I, I do have one uh, myself. Um, this webinar is very timely uh, for those of us who are in Ontario, uh, and perhaps even more so for those of us in Toronto where we elected a mayor who's arguably uh, a polarizing figure. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, you know, the, the differences between a weak mayor system and a strong mayor system. In, 
Is having a weak mayor system uh, an advantage to help balance the interests of constituents, uh, uh, you know, for example, in the case of having a polarizing mayor? Yeah, well, the, the, the strong mayor, um, weak mayor argument is one that there's good points on either side. And the classic of uh, argument against a strong mayor is if you get a bad strong mayor and uh, they um, have uh, you know, much larger authority to do things that, um, that, that a lot of people would disapprove of. And the argument is that uh, by having a mayor that is strongly checked by the council and by uh, the, the supposedly moderating in influence of the council that you'll get um, the, at least the rough edges of, um, of, of some uh, things would be rubbed off. And, uh, and, and that's a good argument. I mean, I, a lot of people say we, we don't need a strong mayor system, we just need strong mayors. And, uh, and, and that's a reasonable argument. I would argue that uh, you, would, you would, in any case, with a strong mayor uh, or a weak mayor, you, you, you would not completely eliminate the role of council, and council would continue to play a strong role and continue to be able to uh, stop move, you know, very rash moves that are against the interests of the, of the city. And because we don't have a strong mayor, I, I would also argue that um, we don't really know what what the effect of a strong mayor system would be. It, clearly, in places like New York and and uh, in Chicago, they've been able to attract people who have been uh, highly capable and uh, have have uh, probably would not have run under a, 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 a system where they were just, in effect, one more counselor. Uh, the, but in a, in a case like uh, Bloomberg in New York, uh, the, the, the fact that he could be very effective, uh, that he had the executive authority, he had the ability to build a strong team around him uh, and could be very effective as mayor was probably one of the major attractions for him in wanting to become mayor. I don't think he would have been that happy uh, if he was going to be spending all of his time cobbling together votes on relatively minor issues. So a strong, a strong mayor system, I think, can attract stronger people, uh, but it's not giving, at the same time, it's not giving carte blanche to anybody to uh, just do whatever they want. Um, so I, I see a lot of people typing, but the questions haven't come through, so I have a chance to ask uh, one more. Um, one of the premises of your book is that uh, Canada is urban, uh, but Canadian cities are much uh, less populated than other uh, sort of world-class cities, um, and sometimes you compare Toronto to New York and London. Um, do you have any comments on how uh, population or density factors um, uh, sort of factor into uh, the decision about which cities deserve more power in the Federation? Well, Canada, I mean, Jane Jacobs used to uh, observe that uh, Canada has too few big cities, and um, and that that really from uh, you know Toronto to Calgary, we there 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 there's not a major large uh, city in there. Uh, we think I think only have uh, nine cities over a million in population. Um, I would make a larger argument that Canada's population is much too small. That we should probably have a population twice what it is, and and uh, and and I I. I I think that would result in some larger cities, but I think inevitably it would just result in Toronto being that much bigger and, and Vancouver being that much bigger. Um, I, I, I think the um, one of the things we have to grapple with as a country, and we're not the only country having to grapple with this, is that uh, big cities are getting bigger and they're different than other parts of the country. And we have to uh, develop our political systems to be able to um, meet the needs of both and accommodate the desires of both and uh, not find one solution that, that will fit all of them, but uh, allow enough uh, sort of local voice to play in decisions that are made and, and the way things are uh, operated and prioritized uh, that, that the local concerns are, are always uh, uh, paid attention to. 
Uh, when you when you talk to Canadians and you talk to them about constitutional arrangements, it's it's almost impossible to find anybody in any part of the country that thinks they work for them. Mm. And I think that's a problem. I think uh, that's a problem we need to uh, try and solve. Um, there are two questions about uh, sort of the international uh, context and how it might influence uh, us here. Um, what, what do you think the emergence, what do you think that the emergence of megacities throughout the world, um, what will impact will that have in the argument uh, regarding the need to strengthen cities? And has there been a uh, transformative change in another jurisdiction that we might learn from? Um, well, I, I, th I, th I think the, uh, the, the, the dominant fact of this century will be the, the building up of large urban regions around the world and, and, uh, and a reduction in the importance of national boundaries. And, uh, and, and it, the, the, the relationships between the large urban regions in the world um, are, are not governmental for the most part, uh, but they're uh, economic primarily. And um, so Toronto's, the cities that Toronto pays attention to and is in competition with internationally are the major financial centers, because we're the financial center of Canada. And, uh, and, and Calgary's uh, kind of sister cities tend to be the petro cities. And I, I, I think that uh, that is going to be a growing phenomenon. Um, the interesting thing about looking at other cities around the world for examples on, um, on uh, good examples to follow or who's getting it right is that uh, whenever you uh, think you've, you've found one and you've let on one and, and uh, so, you know, we, we would in, in Toronto be terribly impressed with New York's planning um, uh, approach and the way they do their planning. And uh, the uh, chief planner of New York, Amanda Burden, was up here recently and just uh, people were terribly impressed with what they were doing down there. Uh, but you get people in New York that take a look at some of the things uh, that are happening here or in, and, and they say, well, gee, I, we wish we could do it the way you're doing it. So things happen, um, you know, lots of cities are getting uh, parts of it right, major parts of it right. I don't know if there's one city that I would look at and say, well, they, they're getting it all right on all fronts. And uh, so part of the exercise that we do at things like the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk Center at the University of Toronto are, are trying to find those examples of people who are getting transit pricing right or people who are getting planning right. and and bring them in and, and, and share that, that example. And I think that that's the kind of discourse that over, over time people are going to find the most useful, that if you're working in immigrant settlement, for example, and in, in, immigrant immigration, you might look at the, the Cities of Migration site uh, website to find out um, what, uh, you know, what, what they're doing in various cities or around using sport as an integration tool or or using labor market integration tools, and uh, you'll you'll find that in the most surprising places they're doing the best things, and I think it's those that sh that virtual sharing of uh, of examples that is going to be the way forward. Um, uh, so here's another question. Uh, this question is about sustainability. I wonder how cities can set their sights on urban forms and functions that are clearly moving towards sustainability, which I believe is still absent. Are there exemplars of sustainable cities, and if so, what, what makes them sustainable? Well, I, I gather sustainability in this context is environmental. Um, that, that's a good question, and maybe uh, Douglas Swartz can uh, uh, sort of clarify that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if, if that is the question, I think if you look at some of the um, Scandinavian cities and in, in the way they're doing um, waste management and cogeneration from waste and, uh, and the way they're doing building, uh, the, the actual uh, quality of building and material choice and uh, <clears throat> density and, and form, I, I think there, there are some terrific examples there of what they're doing. Uh, transportation planning, which is a big part of sustainability, I think you can look at again various of the uh, European cities that are that are doing interesting uh, uh, things. Um, you know, so, some of those 
European transit things are things that we're planning on doing in Toronto, or we were until Monday night, and um, but and, and are likely to still do, I would think. But uh, um. mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Wirtz, um, uh sort of clarified that he meant um, sustainability, like all elements. Uh, so uh, in addition to environment, social, and economic, is there anything about sort of s social and ec economic sustainability that? Um, that we might learn from uh, internationally. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think there are examples. Uh, if, if, the, if the question is any one city getting it all right, the answer is I, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but um, I, I, I think a good part of the sustainability argument goes in my view, would go back to the fiscal arrangements um, argument that I make that uh, you, you need to have some conti continuity of, of, of planning and implementation and accountability uh, that can uh, create a, a, a strong narrative for uh, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's building hard infrastructure or whether it's building social infrastructure for, say, immigrant integration or for uh, you know the disability community or whoever and and you've got to have a relatively you know connected um, way of dealing with with that from sort of the, the conceptualization through to the implementation and reporting back uh, to, to people what's going on uh, and, and that's what leads to your sustainability and it and the, the one thing I think that um, you know, governments can can do better on a lot of these things. Is the governments typically are reasonably good at making change. Uh, they're not that good at selling the change and creating strong narratives about the change that they've created. And one of the things we I think discovered in our election in the city of Toronto uh, this week was that um, while there's a very good story to be told about the. Uh, the servicing into the inner suburbs uh, through infrastructure improvement over the last six or eight years in Toronto, uh, there has not been any kind of sustained narrative about that created. So that um, th there, there's likely to be, you know, some kind of interruption in the ability to provide that kind of thing, and it becomes less sustainable in that sense over time. And so you, you not only have to be able to, uh, you know, make the change, you have to be able to sell the change persuasively. And, uh, and and you know that that's something governments have uh, certainly in Canada I think have been less good at doing than than they could be. Um, here is a question uh, specific about uh, the city of Toronto. Uh, it, is is the fact that the amalgamated city of Toronto is it too big or and too small to be effective in the way that it should be? Yeah, I I, I think it. I think that is the case. Uh, that 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 it's it's. Um, I mean, first of all, it, while everybody says you can't undo it and we shouldn't go back and we should get over the amalgamation, and all the rest of it, my own view is that it was a bad idea, poorly implemented, and uh, which is a, a bit of a fatal, um, you know, kind of a, a double hit. Um, I th I think we at the at this point and and. Uh, you know, we're, we, it looks like in Toronto we're going to be thrown into a debate about uh, reducing the size of council, uh, which is what the incoming mayor has promised that he would do. And I, th I think it gives us the opportunity to really consider what the proper governance for a city of this size is, and uh, and whether we need to have uh, community councils uh, that have real power. Uh, whether we need to have some kind of virtual de-amalgamation and create maybe uh, recreate the old metro style of government, um, it, 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 it's it's a good time for us to um, to be able to put a lot of these things on the table and uh, discuss them again. I mean, the interesting thing was if you if you look at Vancouver, which is my hometown, and um, they, they have all of their city councillors are elected on a citywide basis, and um, and whereas all of Toronto's are elected on a ward basis, 
And so in Toronto, we complain that we don't have enough people with the kind of overarching city view taking the whole good of the city into account and that there's too much ward politics. And if you talk to people in Vancouver, they say, boy, we wish we had that system you have in Toronto. You know, we've got nobody who's really caring about the East End wards or the rest of it, and, and uh, the, the uh, you know, we're, we're, we're poorly served. Uh, so I think that, you know, we need to, um, to, to have this kind of discussion. The, the w one comment I will make about amalgamation is that, uh, having said very negative things about it, uh, is that it caused, it, w it was, whatever you think of it conceptually, it was in management terms a really hard thing to do, to take those cities and put them together and put all the different uh, component pieces together. Difficult politically, it was difficult on a, on, as a management task to do it, and very difficult in terms of uh, managing um, kind of the cultural uh, environment of, of the new city and creating a, an appropriate cultural environment. And I think one of the things it, it led to is a great amount of internalization of the focus of the government of the new city of Toronto as they worked out the processes and tried to figure it out who was sitting where and, and, uh, and how things were going to work. And I, I think what we saw in this election the other night was that um, there has been too much internalization of focus and people were not serving, feeling properly served by their government. And so I, I think the, you know, that, that's one of the negative legacies of the amalgamation is that we've now come to this point where people clearly don't feel the government has been working for them and they, they want some kind of dramatic change in the orientation of government. And, um, and it's something I think that the, uh, you know, the management at the City of Toronto needs to look at. But I would say that the management of uh, most governments and most city governments in Canada probably needs to look at the same thing as well, is that uh, you know, they're there for citizens and they need to be oriented more towards the citizen than towards the internal processes of governing their city. Um, in, your, in your presentation you highlighted uh, sort of the, mo the, the incremental, the moderate and the transformational. Um, uh, there was a question about whether there's perhaps sort of an intermediate stage, perhaps between the uh, sort of incremental and the moderate, um, where there's regional integration um, before proceeding to a longer term goal of uh, province like powers. Um, and what might that look like today? Well, we've, we've um, we go through these waves of wanting to be regional and then discovering that regional, regional governments don't work that well, so we kind of unregion, or we, you get some part of the region growing up to be much stronger than other parts of the region and they, they want to have more kind of autonomy um, themselves. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would, would kind of revisit that. I think what it looks, what it's going to look like though is, um, and, and the, a good example is, is uh, Metrolinx and the creation of a bunch of regional bodies that um, that are functionally oriented. Um, you know, we have been effectively uh, regionalized and amalgamated around a number of things uh, for decades. Policing, uh, movement of water, and, and uh, you know, there, there are cooperations on, between various cities on the borders around things like uh, snow clearing and uh, parks maintenance and the rest of it. And so we, we, we tend to be able to work these things out either on a locally negotiated basis at the border or on by the creation of regional bodies. And um, you know, while it's early days to say whether Metrolinx and, and you know, the uh, TransLink in Vancouver would be the analog to, to it, 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 whether it's go it, it, it will work, whether it's going to be as effective as we hope it will be. Uh, but um, that may be the model, rather than creating a, uh, you know, an, an overall regional government or regional government approach to it, that we do it along the lines of creating functional regional bodies. Um, uh, here's a, uh, another question. To what extent do international trade agreements hamper decisions regarding local purchase so that even if cities had more destiny, they'd still be handcuffed by federally negotiated agreements? Well, I'm sure that, that 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 is a considerable problem, and I, I, I won't comment on it because I 
I'm not I don't have any expertise at all on that but uh, but obviously that is a is a concern and we've seen some of that come up in, in recent years um, assuming that uh, urban problems are best confronted uh, when both citizens and elected leaders are motivated by a commitment to civic uh, virtues, um, and these might include, for example, tolerance, concern, and attitude of trusteeship, uh, do you think that um, one just has to hope that these motivations are widespread, or are there ways to encourage them? Um. And that's, it's a it's a good question. Um, they certainly don't seem to have been um, in recent elections, and I would say in future elections, what people think uh, will carry the day in terms of getting electoral support. Um, I I was very concerned in this Toronto election with the extent to which uh, virtually all of the candidates, except one we're bashing the city and um, it's, it's concerning for a couple of reasons. One is that it tends to push into uh, the, back, the deep background all of those uh, virtues that the questioner asked about. Uh, but also, uh, you know, part of, part of the future of any city is the attraction of investment to that city. And that is almost always a competition uh, between your city and some other city. So in the case of uh, Toronto, you know, we might be uh, competing to get the headquarters of a company or a plant from a company with Boston or with, uh, you know, Manchester or, or, or some other city. And, um, and you can be sure that uh, the uh, economic development officers in Boston will be uh, going on the YouTube and, and following the Toronto newspapers to uh, pick out uh, statements that have been made about Toronto that cast Toronto in a negative light. And if they can get uh, uh, candidates for mayor saying that, that the city's a disaster and the politicians are on the take and everything's terrible, uh, that uh, they'll use that in that competition and, and, uh, and, and, it, and it will hurt us uh, in, in getting those, th those things. Um, the, the I, I've been very concerned also in <clears throat> in recent years, not just related to this election, but <clears throat> at the way the uh, the press has been characterizing politicians and and uh, constantly slagging them and uh, f finding fault even when the faults are minor, and uh, and any and characterizing. Uh, Things as as much as possible as scandals or uh, uh, betrayal of duty and and, and that sort of thing, um, and even when they say something praiseworthy about a politician, they praise something a politician has done. Uh, they immediately find a voice to say it's not so good. So if uh, the premier of a province does uh, brings in a good piece of legislation. Uh, they'll find the leader of the opposition will say it's a terrible piece of legislation, and uh, and that plays in the public's mind, and 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 uh, and they begin to think of politicians as uh, not only uh, you know untrustworthy and uh, and perhaps uh, dishonest, but they certainly don't think of them in terms of the virtues, and uh, so I, I you know I. It, can we encourage it? Well, can we encourage a, a more encouraging coverage of politicians and their behavior? Um, this may, may be a good question for us to ask our friends in the press. Um, who, uh, what players or factors, force or factors or forces need to come together uh, to change or update our constitutional arrangements so that we can meet our future challenges um, or at least strengthen our competitive position as cities? Well, first of all, I think we need to have our cities, them, our city leaders themselves, uh, begin to um, speak more strongly, and and um, and certainly the big city mayors and uh, some of the leading councillors, I think, need to uh, get together. Uh, about a decade ago. Uh, we were involved with Jane Jacobs in creating something called the C5 Mayor's Meetings, which I referred to earlier. 
and um, and it was the mayors of uh, Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Winnipeg, Toronto, and Montreal, and that was the first time they'd met uh, as a group uh, with the purpose of promoting an agenda for cities in Canada, and. Um, they're all members of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which is a terrific organization, but it represents whatever the number of cities there are in Canada. I think it's like three or four thousand members they have, and uh, and that means that their members run from cities that are have population in the hundreds uh, to the city of Toronto, which is the largest largest city. Uh, and uh, they don't have common agendas, they, they don't uh, have common concerns or issues uh, for the most part and uh, so FCM finds it difficult to advocate for one, one group uh, without the, the others being along. Uh, so I think the cities, the, the, the big city leaders need to get together in, in a very uh, concerted and consistent and, and kind of uh, un, unfaltering way uh, promote the, the, the city's ad, ad agenda. But the other thing is that I find surprising is how few Canadians uh, even um, have cities and the role of cities and the importance of cities in their, uh, in, in, in their sites at all. Uh, our corporate leaders very seldom uh, have, have that. That very seldom participate in that kind of uh, advocacy or that, even that kind of conversation. Um, the, the press certainly doesn't uh, do it. They, they, they focus on national issues and secondarily provincial issues, but very, very seldom city issues as, um, a, a, as anything more than things that happen to have happened in a city. And uh, and I think that that that's uh, that we we need to change the conversation somehow, and get more people understanding that their future is is really tied to the uh, success of our urban regions. Is is there anything about the voting system that might uh, change to to sort of give cities more more voice? Well, th there are a number of. Um, recommended um, improvements and changes to the voting system and uh, the one that I find the most interesting and the most uh, appealing uh, is, is the uh, giving uh, non-citizens in our cities the right to vote in municipal elections and uh, some people would extend that argument and say they should be able to vote in, in any election but in Canada we don't allow people to vote in an election unless they they have acquired their citizenship in the country, and we accept that as kind of the basic, fundamental um, standard that we should observe. Uh, around the world, that is not uh, uniformly accepted as the standard. In in New Zealand, you can vote in any election uh, just after a period of residency. You don't need to have citizenship st uh, status. In various uh, European cities, you have the same ability. Uh, in the European Union, uh, there, uh, uh, under the, the, the documents of the Union, <coughs> people uh, can vote in any election in any other country in the European Union. They don't have to be a citizen of that country to vote in the election. In the election. So I, I, I think you know we have always uh, changed our criteria of who can vote in an election in Canada. It, originally it was just uh, 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 property owning British men and uh, we've made progress through the ranks over the years. We in included women and uh, and uh, you know have, have honed it over the years. We didn't even have citizenship in Canada until 1948. Uh, so we, we have been consistently changing who can vote and I think um, there there several reasons to allow uh, non-citizens uh, to vote in municipal elections. Uh, one, one is that it's, uh, um, with, they pay taxes, uh, they're required to pay their taxes and obey the laws, etc. They should have some say in how those tax dollars are spent and I think there is a real uh, civil rights issue and, and, and 
the uh, Canadian Civil Liberties Association is in agreement that this is uh, something that needs to be looked at seriously from a rights perspective. But also the other issue in, in this is that uh, our future is so, and our past really, is, is so tied to immigration and uh, because of our aging, um, uh, aging population and uh, uh, our, our gaps that are going to appear in the, in the labor market are already appearing in the labor market, uh, we need to attract the best and the brightest immigrants. And, uh, and to offer this as a uh, as an inclusive gesture, and also an an, an attraction uh, to make people want to come here, to, so they can participate in our country uh, for, for, very quickly and be involved in some of the major one of the major rights in a in a country. I think is is very important. So I think that would change who votes. Uh, it, it would. Um, I don't think it's predictable in changing how how they would vote, but it would in, uh, give a, a, a considerable number of people an increased level of engagement in their communities and their cities, and I think that's a, a big plus. Um, do you think that strong cities or um, you know cities with strong powers uh, could undermine uh, sort of? The vision of Canada or Canadian citizenship, like could could your proposal exacerbate uh, regional divisions? Um, I, I I don't see that. What I see it exacerbating might be the the um, the urban rural divide. But I think you can deal with that. I I, I think there's a way to. Um, to manage that, and and that is by making sure that the um, the kind of powers and the ability for self-definition are um, extended to the uh, rural areas as well. That uh, they're not uh, required to do a bunch of things just because urban regions have been permitted to do them. So I think it's that particularity of approach that that's important. I, the um, I don't I don't think it would weaken. Uh, national unity, I don't think it would, I think in some ways it could strengthen it uh, by creating stronger ties between uh, the urban regions that are all competing to carry the country forward economically, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that it would weaken the nation. We only have a few more minutes. Uh, would you like to provide any concluding comments before I, I wrap up? Uh, no, I, the only concluding comment I, I would do is to revisit this notion that uh, unless we begin to pay more attention to our urban regions and the place of our urban regions and until we begin to empower them in the way that, uh, that, that, that I'm suggesting, uh, I think we're going to be shackled in our ability to compete internationally. And, uh, and uh, that, that that's a price that uh, we, we pay now, but uh, the price that future generations are going to pay as well. So I would like to see us get uh, get more oriented towards dealing with the, this as an important national issue uh, sooner than later. Well, thank you very much, Alan, and, and thank you very much to our participants.